Matt Kaufman is an associate professor in the University of Wyoming's Department of Zoology and Physiology. But what's important about Matt is that he represents not only the university, but the way the university works with the state and, and, and with the nation. Uh, his full, to try and give his full description here, Matt is the leader of the Wyoming Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, uh, which means that he works with and for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and the U.S. Geological Survey, which is the research arm of the federal government into um, natural things. At any one time, his research unit has six to ten uh, people working in it with him. Uh, most of them are graduate students, um, and he's training them uh, as part of their education to become wildlife managers. And uh, why University of Wyoming and people like Matt are training not just the bulk of Wyoming's wildlife managers, but are sending uh, professional wildlife managers out into the rest of the nation. Matt's PhD is from the University of California at Santa Cruz in environmental studies. Now what that means is that you can't simply say that Matt's research is focusing on big animals uh, and leave it at that. He wants to know the interactions among varieties of species as well as ways their lives and interactions are affected by human activities. His research unit has focused on elf and wolf interaction in northwestern Wyoming, a project that grew to include both the impact of grizzlies and moose. They've also investigated whether the introduction of wolves into Yellowstone did something odd like increasing the growth of aspen by altering elk forage habits. Finally, just to mention today's topic, Matt's team studies the annual travels of ungulates. It's one of his favorite words, ungulates. Um, meaning deer, elk, bighorn sheep, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and just recently uh, has discovered the longest mule deer migration in the Northern Hemisphere. So let me give you Dr. Matt Kaufman, who will speak to us today about the migrations of Wyoming's deer, elk, and moose, ecology and conservation amid changing landscapes. Matt. Well, thank you, Paul, uh, for that introdu introduction. And, and thank you all for coming. It's always uh, a kind of a special treat to come to, to Jackson to talk about wildlife issues, since this is a community that says, has such passion for its wildlife. So today I'm going to be talking about migrations, uh, and especially ungulate migrations, our hooved mammals. Uh, so what do our migrations look like, and where are they? So, so this is what some of our migrations look like. And about three or four months ago, when spring came to Wyoming, something like this unfolded around the state. So down in the Platte Valley, mule deer migrated out of their winter ranges down into the park range of Colorado and literally off the map. Um, other mule deer that winter near Bags migrated up into the, started their migrations up into the Sierra Madres. Other mule, mule deer that winter down in the southern Wyoming range started their migrations up and literally up the spine of the Wyoming range and, and others migrated up into the, the Wyoming range and the Grovant and some of them made it all the way into Jackson. Pronghorn from the upper green uh, began their migrations into the, into the Wyoming range and up into summer ranges near Pinedale and some of these pronghorn would have, would have overlapped with those famous path of the pronghorn that make their migrations all the way up uh, between the Grovants and the winds into Jackson. And some of those pronghorn um, would, have, would have summered near where moose winter in the Buffalo Valley and before they migrate up into southern Yellowstone. And some of those moose go up into a place called the thoroughfare where perhaps some of you have been and if you haven't you should go. And there they might mingle with elk that come up from Cody to the same summer range. And so Probably in a, a several days, the snow will start flying and this whole thing will reverse and these animals will come out of the mountains and go back to their winter range. So Wyoming has some of the best uh, wildlife habitat on the planet, but for our big game, they have to move to get there, to access it. And that's uh, the process we call migration. And migration is... Um, it's, these, it's this kind of spectacle of large groups of animals moving across the landscape. This is, one of, this is one of the things that makes Wyoming one of the truly last wild places in the West. And I, I would say that it's part of the state's cultural heritage. 
So what is, uh, what is migration and why do the animals do it? So it's basically mostly about food. So if you live in Wyoming, you know we have a really short growing season. But for our, for our migratory ungulates, that growing season is e even shorter because they have to access the green grass when it's just first coming up. That's when it's most nutritious, and that's, uh, that's when it's the highest quality to them. So, so migration is, is basically about following spring as it marches up the mountain, accessing green grass um, on summer range. And during their migration, that's when these animals will put on all the fat um, that they'll put on that year. And then when the snows come, it'll pu push them out of the mountains, and they'll carry that fat with them. And it's that fat that will get them through the winter. Almost 90% of our, of our ungulates in Wyoming are migratory. Um, and, and it's really this, this is the solution that these animals have come up to, to deal with our, the harsh seasonal environment that we have in Wyoming. And, and it's this movement, this migration, this, this is the key to the, the abundance uh, of, of, of big game that we have in this state. Okay, so there will be a quiz on this slide at the, at the end. Um, this is... Uh, this is the one slide that sort of represents that, you know, if you, if you miss this, you'll have a difficult time understanding the rest of my talk. Even if you get this, you might have a difficult time <laughs> understanding the rest of my talk. Um, but so, so this is putting some, putting some data to the idea of following spring. So here is percent protein. These are, these are grass, grasses and forbs that, that elk eat. And here on the x-axis is early is May, so the beginning of spring to November, and this is their protein content. So, so here you see the declining quality of the plants that these animals eat. It's highest in spring. And if you want to relate this to your own life, fiber is good for humans if we're dieting, but, it's, but these animals aren't dieting. They're trying to put on fat, and fiber is bad for them. Um, and so while protein is declining, fiber is also increasing. You can think of your sort of fresh spring salad mix. That's the highest quality forage. Okay, so next um, critical topic, NDVI. This is um, normalized difference vegetation index, or greenness. So these are measurements that we take from satellites, and th this is just, uh, this is just what, what the greenness of a landscape looks from space, and, and this uh, should relate to, to most of us here. Um, this is spring, when things are just starting to green up. This is peak summer or peak green up, when, when everything is greened up, and then this is fall as things start to brown down. And we, use, we, we can do these measurements on any chunk of land and, and relate it to, you know, to when the plants are greening up and when the animals are there. And so, you know, this, this period in early spring, when the plants are of highest quality, relates to this period here on the NDVI curve, the greenness curve when things are just greening up. Okay, and I'll, unfortunately for you, I'll be returning to this NDVI curve multiple times throughout the talk. So, um, so hopefully you, you've all got it. And, and just to, um, one last point about this, um, this is the fat dynamics of, of elk near Cody. And through, through winter, end of summer, next winter, end of summer, and so, um, you don't have to take my word for it. You can see in winter these animals are in poor shape. They have very little fat. And then in summer, then they migrate to productive summer ranges. They put on a bunch of fat. And then they go into winter and lose it all. And then they do that again. And so this cycle of fat dynamics, fat is the currency of life for our big game. And migration and foraging of the, on the fresh green grass is how they get there. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on four topics today. I'm going to stop with stopover ecology, which sort of drills down a little bit deeper to how animals track the green grass and, and, and track phenology, the timing of spring. Uh, then I'm going to talk about drought and predation with Cody up near, uh, with elk near Cody. I'm going to talk about uh, winter feeding, which happens along the Wyoming Range and the Wind River Range. And then I'm going to end with this section on migrations and some of the challenges of sustaining migrations on multiple use lands. So first, to start with stopover ecology. Several years ago, uh, my student, my PhD student, Hall Sawyer, um, recognized something peculiar from the migratory routes of mule deer. So this is, uh, this is a typical uh, data set that we get when we collar these animals. 
So here they are in winter range. There's a pile of points. These points might be every two or three hours. And then you can see they start their migration up to their summer range. And what hopefully you can see, there are these clusters where they're not migrating at all and they're actually stopping over. And we developed methods to identify those stopovers. And they're, they're here in the, in the dark blue. And, um, and mule deer, when they migrate, spend a lot of their time in these stopover areas. So we think of migration as, as movement, as moving from winter range to summer range. But in fact, mule deer in western Wyoming spend 95% of their time, and these, in this case, are three week long migrations, 95% of their time, they're not migrating, they're not moving at all, they're stopped over and foraging. And so we wondered, why do they do that? Um, why do they spend their time in these stopovers? And then you, know, you can also identify these movement corridors where they're actually getting closer to summer range. Well, um, so the, the avian ecologists are, are way ahead of us, and they've, they've for years, have developed a, a stopover ecology of, of birds, and they understand its, its role. No one's ever identified or characterized the stopover ecology of, of migratory ungulates. And we had this idea that their stopover use essentially allowed them to track the green grass and track phenology to follow spring up the mountain. And so, um, so we, we set about testing that. And what I'm going to show you here, this is just this is the migration of one animal from winter range to summer range. The background is that NDVI image, just one image. You can see it's much greener on their summer range than their winter range. And then, th then these are the stopovers. Um, so what we did was we just sort of drilled into each of those stopovers and, 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 and built that NDVI curve and said, how green is the, is the grass when these animals are visiting the stopover? Okay? And so here's that NDVI curve. This is real data, so it's, so it's a little bit messy. But on all these graphs I'm going to show you as we march through this migration, here's the peak green up with these sort of long solid dashes. And then here's when the animal is actually there. And what you're going to see is that they're always there during spring. They're always there at, the, at sort of when, when the plants are just greening up. So if we, if we march from winter range to summer range, um, this animal's there about a month and a half prior to peak green up. Um, same when it gets to this stopover and that stopover. You can see that spring is slowly moving. Uh, you know, the peak green up is slowly um, ad advancing. But the deer are always there. They, they never stay there beyond, um, you know, for peak green up. They move to the next one as, green, as, as the green wave passes them by and goes up the mountain. And then, uh, when, you, when you put a bunch of deer together and look at their, and do this, we find that, that deer use stopovers about 44 days plus or minus a week prior to peak green up. So, so, they're, so they're using these stopovers with this very narrow range, right? They're, they're basically, so we call this tracking phenology or surfing the green wave. Um, and, and, and that's what they're doing. They're accessing the plants when they're first greening up when they're most nutritious to them, okay? Everybody with me? Okay. So, uh, and remember, 95% of their time, they're feeding. So this, this changes the way we think about migration, because now we need to think about migration not just as a means of getting to your summer range or getting back to winter range, but we need to think of migration and the migration route as habitat, because these animals spend three weeks here, and it's three weeks um, when they're coming off the, you know, the risk of winter starvation. So at starvation, they're on, at the end of winter, they're on their knees, and, and many of them near starvation, and then they start to do this and access the best forage quality that they're going to see uh, in, in the year. Okay, so, so that's stopover ecology. I'll return to that uh, in the later part of the talk. Now I want to talk about drought and predation. Um, and for this, I'm going to turn to Cody and uh, a partially migratory elk herd. So, um, some of our herds are partially migratory, and what that means, uh, and it's illustrated here, is that part of the herd is migratory, and it shares range with part of the herd that are resident, that do not migrate. And you can see that here. Here's the town of Cody. These uh, animals in, in gray, this is their year-round range, so they do not migrate. They're, um, they're here in winter and summer. But for these migrants in black, this is their winter range. Actually, this is their winter range. But then in the spring, they migrate up into Yellowstone. And so you have, you have uh, partial migration, which allows us to sort of compare 
uh, what's going on with residents versus migrants. And in this case, there are some dramatic differences between the, the, the ability of migrants to recruit calves compared to residents. And so I'm ind indexing that here with calves per 100 cows. And here in the black dots, you can see over the last 20 years, the migrant the calf production by migrants have dec has declined steadily and rather dramatically, and their, their calf production now is in the, in the low teens. And it's very hard to grow elk in Wyoming with calf production in the, in the low teens. Meanwhile, the residents are, are stable or increasing. So what we've seen is, is declining recruitment, you know, declining fitness of the migrants. And, and, you know, and the question was, well, why is this happening? Um, we know, we know that part of it is pregnancy rate. The residents have a very typical pregnancy rate from Rocky Mountain Elk, 90%, but the migrants have this pregnancy rate around 73%, which is extremely low for Rocky Mountain Elk. And, and typically, when you have a pregnancy rate that low, that, that indicates that they're not getting enough high-quality food. So um, what we know in elk and other temperate ungulates is that Pregnancy d depends on the amount of fat these animals put on over summer. So they put on fat during summer, and then if they're fat enough in the fall, they breed. If they're not fat enough, they don't breed. And so we look to summer conditions to understand the, the reduction in pregnancy and the reduction in calf recruitment. And so there's the NDVI curve again. And so what we did in this case is we drilled down into the summer range, and we asked, we looked at this period when spring uh, w w when spring is first coming and when things are greening up. And we asked over 20 years, well, the, the idea that we had was that, that, that spring was coming faster because we've, had, we've seen um, warming temperatures and less precipitation in this part of, of, of Yellowstone, which is the summer range of these animals. So we asked, you know, is, is spring coming faster and, and for a shorter window, and is that potentially what's, what's impairing their ability to put on the fat they need? to be pregnant and produce calves. And, and what we found was that that is indeed the, indeed the case. So here's over 20 years. What I'm showing you here is max NDVI, so it's the, it's the slope of this. And what you can see is that that slope is getting steeper and steeper over the last 20 years. Where, and this is 20 years where we've seen the most warming in this part of the world that we've, that we've seen since we've been measuring it for over a century. And, and this is consistent with climate change. Um, and drought that, that, has, that has hit the northwest part of the state in the greater Yellowstone. And so what we see, what, you know, the interpretation here is that drought is causing everything to green up faster and everything to green up at the same time, and it reduces the window of time that these animals have to surf the green wave and access the high-quality patches. Okay, so here a drought indication of, of uh, a, a drought indication which is influencing forage quality and sort of the calf recruitment, the fitness benefits of migration. There's one other part of this story, which is predators. And so in this part of the world, and this is kind of true for a lot of our elk herds in the greater Yellowstone, the residents kind of uh, get a free pass when it comes to wolves and grizzly bears because out there there's a lot of calf cattle and those predators are lethally removed and managed for very low numbers. But, um, but in the rest of this, in, in the, the forest outside of the park and in the park, this is literally where we keep our predators. This is where we keep wolves and grizzly bears. And, and so the migratory animals have a much higher um, exposure to predators and higher rates of predation um, by wolves and grizzly bears. So that's another, and, and those are both prey on calves. So that's another con factor contributing to the low calf recruitment of the migrants. Okay, so what we, what we see in this case is, is kind of this flip. Migration is this, we see migration all around the world, and we, and we see it because it's very successful. But here, the benefits are kind of flipped. In the parks, we have carnivore recovery and drought, and, that's, and, and so those two things are making life more difficult for the migrants. And on the, on the sort of front range, in the mixed-use landscape, we have agriculture, we have carnivore removal, we also have irrigation, which provides a sort of food subsidy, which I haven't talked about. But this is kind of flipping the benefits of migration making it harder for the migrants and making it easier for the residents. I want to turn now to winter feeding. Um, so, so we feed elk in Wyoming. Um, we feed a lot of elk in Wyoming. We feed about 20,000 elk uh, in Wyoming, 22 uh, feed grounds, including the National Elk Refuge, which is just outside. We've been feeding elk for over a century. 
Um, and this was originally done uh, to basically help elk get through the winter, and then also to keep elk, as they come down on their migrations, to keep them from uh, coming onto private land. Uh, but hopefully, you're, you're getting the sense that, that migration is about how these animals exploit where food is on the landscape, right? That's, that's what they're doing. That's, that's why they migrate. And so this is a case where we're changing where the food is on the landscape. And, and no one's really asked, well, how does that change the migratory patterns of these animals, the fact that you know, there's, there's winter feed, there's, there's feed on the winter every year. Okay, so that's what we asked in this, uh, in this project. And so the, here, are, here are the feed grounds, 22 different feed grounds, the National Elk Refuge along the, the front of the Winds and the Wyoming Range. And then, uh, so we had animals collared um, in all of these feed grounds, and then we also additionally collared animals in these four native winter range areas. And so I'll refer, this is basically a comparison between fed elk on the feed grounds in red and unfed elk in the blue areas that are accessing native winter range. And so what we did was basically just compare the migratory patterns of these animals. With, with this GPS technology, very um, you know, hourly locations of these animals, this is, this is sort of the, 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 the track of one animal. And, you, and here they are in winter range. They migrate up in the spring. Here they are in summer range. They migrate back down in the fall. And so you can characterize when they're on winter range, when they begin their spring migration, how far they go when they're on summer range. And we basically characterize this migration pattern or profile for all the unfed elk and for all the fed elk, and then just ask if they're different. And so they are, they are different. Um, the, and one of the ways in, in which they are, are most different is the time that they spend on summer range. And so that's shown here. So the unfed elk spend about a month longer on summer range. And remember, you know, summer range, this is, this is the time when they're putting on fat. This is the time when they're accessing all that fresh green grass. Um, so this was kind of, this was striking. There were other changes, there were other differences as well, but this was the most striking. And then we asked sort of, you know, why, why does that happen? And, and, it, and, and the reasons are kind of interesting. So in the spring, what happens is when the green wave comes, the unfed elk cue into that and follow it up to summer range. But the fed elk, Basically, the feed grounds hold them in the spring on their winter ranges, and they're slow to follow the green up, and, and they arrive on summer range later than the udfen animals. And then, so, so that's sort of the, the first, so there's an effect on this, the timing of their spring migration. And then in fall, and I think this is actually more interesting, in the fall, so these animals share the same summer range. Some are fed, some are not, but, the, but up in the winds and the Wyoming range, they're on the same summer range. And so we know that cold temperatures and precipitation trigger the, the fall migration in elk. And what, what we've seen in this case is that it only takes a little bit of cold temperatures and a little bit of snow to trigger the migrations of the fed animals. So, so winter starts to come. The fed animals start their fall migration earlier, leaving summer range, and the unfed animals stay up there, uh, presumably because that's where the good food is. They know there's not going to be good food for them. They're going back down to crappy native winter range. Um, all winter range is crappy. That's not a, a, a critique of how we're managing our winter range. Um, so, so basically, these animals differ in how sensitive to, they are to, to the, how the snow triggers their fall migration. And, and, that, and that's what results in these unfed animals spending a, uh, close to a summer, uh, uh, you know, a month longer on their summer range. So, what are the implications of this? Well, we've been um, feeding elk for over a century, and and what this suggests is that, um, you know, not surprisingly, my, these animals cue into where food is and when it arrives, and 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 that's how they um, trigger their their migrations, and that's how they pattern their migrations, and we've kind of disrupted that. The irony here is that the feed grounds exist to help manage elk during winter and help keep them separate from private lands and separate from cattle. And the irony here is that what we're showing is that the feed grounds also lengthen the time that these animals are winter and shorten the time that they're on summer range. So, um, 
you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of information uh, and the story of feed grounds is continuing to unfold. But, and so this is just sort of one, one of the next chapters. Okay, so I want to end um, talking about what it takes, what it might take to sustain some of these migrations in multiple use lands. This map will also be on the quiz. <laughs> so what you're looking at is the world's longest mule deer migration. It was discovered by my colleague Hal Sawyer about a couple years ago, and we assessed it and documented it um, just recently in, in the spring. So um, these animals winter near rock springs, just north of I-80, and then they migrate 150 miles through the, through the Red Desert, along the Pinedale Front, and beyond Bondurant, and up into the upper Hoback. And so these animals are summering right now just, just over the hill from Jackson. Um, we knew about this migration, but we didn't know that it extended all the way down to I-80. Um, a lot of our migrations in Wyoming look like this. They're not all this long, but they, but they cross the same type of country that these animals cross. And that really challenges uh, our ability to manage uh, these migrations. And so what I'm going to show you here is sort of a profile elevation. And then this is land use. Uh, and so when these animals start on winter range, this is that classic private BLM checkerboard. And then as they start migrating, um, they get into northern red desert where it's mostly BLM. Then they cross Highway 80, get to Farson, and then they get along that Pinedale front. And now you're running into lots of private land, BLM, the state-run feed grounds, forest, back onto private. Uh, and so this really complicates um, you know, how we, what we might need to do to manage these migrations in the long term. Finally, once they get up on, on the forest on summer range, you know, their life is relatively predictable. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's lots of things that are changing the, the landscapes and uh, the habitats and our mixed use landscapes on BLM and private land. And one of those is energy development. This is the Jonah field shown here. This probably picture isn't not too, is, is probably familiar to many people. Um, you know, lots of, these are all well pads and roads, so increased you know, fragmentation and lots of human disturbance, um, people and, and vehicles. So across all western Wyoming, this is, this is sort of what that looks like. In red here are the active gas wells. And then I'm showing, here's the red desert to Hoback. So mule deer migrations are in brown, elk migrations are in uh, blue, and pronghorn migrations are in orange. And so in Wyoming, the way natural gas development is occurring, it, it, we've, natural gas development has a footprint that occurs across a vast landscape equal to the landscapes in which these animals migrate. And we simply um, don't know what, what this means for the sort of connectivity, the functionality of these migration routes. And there are other changes as well, um, such as, as rural subdivision, that challenge you know, how these animals make these, these journeys. And so I've been thinking about this for several years. And, um, and over the last few years, our research has, has, parted, has started to sort of piece together um, what, really how challenging this is going to be to maintain these migrations. Uh, and so just earlier this week at a conference in Yellowstone, I put forward a hypothesis which I think captures how we need to think about these migrations and how we need to think about managing them going forward. And so I refer to that as the incremental loss of migration hypothesis. And um, I'll define that in a minute. What I want to do is, is talk about the, the, the sort of premises for it. So the first is the foraging benefit of migration. So we've already talked about this. We, we, we need to think of migration routes as habitat. And it's, and it's not just accessing that habitat, it's accessing at the right time of year, right? Following the spring green up. So that's the first one. The second premise is that, um, is that th there's development in the migratory corridors of a lot of these, of these migratory animals. And, um, to show, here's a pronghorn example to show you that. There's the town of Pinedale in 1954, and here's the migration of, of pronghorn coming off their winter range through this area called Antelope Alley, heading up to Summer Range. And then here you can see you know, all the development that has occurred in that corridor. Now in this case, these animals are still migrating through there. But the point is that you know, when all this development happened, you know, this map wasn't, this route wasn't on the map. 
this route wasn't in the planning process. We don't, we don't plan the way development occurs because of where migration corridors exist. So that means that development is going to continue to, to occur in areas um, irrespective of whether a corridor is there. Some of our research has shown that migrating animals respond to this development by altering their behavior while migrating. And so here's an example of that. These are animals um, south of Rollins going through a, a gas field. Uh, here's just three animals. And what, what we did was we compared their rate of movement when they're going through the gas field with their rate of movement off of the gas field. And that's shown here. Each one of these dots is one animal. The, the black dot is their rate of movement in sort of the undeveloped portion of their route. And the red dot is the rate of movement going through the gas field. And so what you can see, because all of these red dots are, are above the black dots for the most part, that means that in most cases, these animals speed up when they go through developed portions of their route. Uh, other work that we have done has shown in the same gas field that animals detour, this is the same animal two different years, that they detour around um, their uh, developed areas of their routes. We've also shown that they stop over less and feed less in developed portions of their route. So this uh, indicates that the, the behavioral response of these animals, speeding up, detouring, stopping over less, means that we're diminishing the foraging benefit that these animals receive while they, while they migrate. Fourth premise, learning and cultural transmission. So for, for our migratory ungulates, there is no genetic basis to these migrations. If you captive rear animals and you plunk them down in rock springs, they will not migrate. They migrate because they learned how to migrate from their mothers. They, their calves, fawns are born sometime along the migration or up in summer range. And then that first fall, they migrate back with their mom. Probably, then they go through winter. In the next spring, they probably migrate perhaps again with their mom or with their natal group. And so they learn these migrations. So this migration, as spectacular as it is, it, I'm showing you on this map, but really the only place it exists is in the brains of the mule deer that are on the landscape today. So this creates the, this creates the possibility that um, you know, if, if these mule deer are impacted and, and, and dwindle, so also dwindles their knowledge of these routes. And so the incremental loss of migration hypothesis um, is sort of defined here, in, and it's in two parts. Increasing levels of development in migratory corridors will alter the foraging behavior of individuals and the associated fitness benefits of migration. So this first part is the idea that, that we're, we're developing in their corridors, changing their behaviors. They can't access the green grass when they need to. And so they're going to get less foraging benefits from migrating. The second part, over the long term, reduced functionality of migra migra migratory routes will lead to local extirpation of individuals that use and have cultural knowledge of impacted routes. So, so this last part is that you know, this, this, is a, this is a long term view. This is what might happen in the long term if routes are impacted enough. And we don't know where those threshold levels are. But we can also step back back and ask, well, how will we know if this hypothesis is right? How will we know if we're losing routes? And the answer to that is we probably won't. There's a few routes, like the Path of the Ponghorn and now the Red Desert to Hoback, that we know well enough um, that we might be able to detect changes in those routes. But for most of the routes, the hundreds of routes that our migratory anglets depend on, we're not mapping them, we're not monitoring them, we don't know and we won't know if they, you know, if, if, if they start to be incrementally lost. So that's a challenge for research, it's a challenge uh, for monitoring. And we're not the only people thinking about migration. Um, Wyomingites and um, agencies and NGOs know that migration is sort of part of Wyoming, it's part of what makes Wyoming unique, and it's something that we need to conserve. And there's been lots of efforts ranging from collaborations between YDOT and Game and Fish to put overpasses and underpasses um, that, have, that have helped tens of thousands of animals um, cross our, our highways safely. Um, land trusts have been active. Uh, this is a quote from a Nature Conservancy press release. This now conserved land provides crucial and rapidly disappearing big game migration corridors. So the land trusts are focused on migratory corridors and there's been lots of groups working, especially in Jackson Hole, uh, to make fencing more wildlife friendly, including uh, you know, for migratory ungulates. 
But the, but the challenge is that all of that work is not getting done necessarily in the right places. It, it's not um, being coupled with where those critical routes are, where the critical stopover areas are. And so we sort of recognized this gap. And two years ago, we started something called the Wyoming Migration Initiative, which I direct. And the mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of Wyoming's migratory ungulates by conducting innovative research and sharing scientific information through public outreach. And so we're basically we're trying to bridge this gap between what we're learning about these migrations and how unique they are and all the conservation efforts that are going on in the ground. And so um, I just don't want to tell you briefly about some of the things we've been doing. We have a website, which is sort of a portal um, for all the information and, and the sort of some of the stories that we're telling. Um, you can access that at migrationinitiative.org. Uh, we're, we're, con we're building, compiling an atlas of wildlife migration. This is patterned after the uh, Atlas of Yellowstone, which uh, hopefully some of you have seen. We're working with the same cartographers at the University of Oregon. This, um, so there are lots of stories of, of Wyoming's migratory ungulates, and they're phenomenal stories. Um, but they've never been told all in one place. A few of them have been told the Path of the Pronghorn and now the Red Desert to Hoback. Um, but this, this book will tell all of their stories in one place, and, and you can see here it goes through uh, you know, all the ecology, the, why these animals migrate, how they benefit, what they looked like historically, what the current threats are, and what some of the conservation efforts. Um, there's a new institute at the University of Wyoming called the Biodiversity Institute, and this is part of their biodiversity book series. And then the other thing we're doing is trying to get this information into the hands of the people that need to use it. So there's been over 50 GPS scholar studies in Wyoming, but they don't exist all in one place. And so we're trying to do that with, um, this is also on the website, we refer to this as the Migration Database and Viewer. This is ac accessible to every person in this room who has an internet connection. Um, you can try it on your smartphone, I've tried it, it doesn't work very well. Um, but what you can do here is, is you can zoom in, so these are Cody elk, you can zoom into your favorite place in Wyoming, you can look at what data sets we have, and you can view the routes, you can animate the routes, you can look at where they go, when they're there. The idea is, is twofold. One, to get people excited about migrations and let people learn for themselves what we're learning about these migrations, and then also to make this data available to managers and NGOs so they can use it to, to do better work on the ground and prioritize that work on the ground. And then the final thing I want to tell you about is work that we're doing sort of trying to address this inc incremental loss issue. And so when we discovered the Red Desert to Hoback uh, migration, we, we decided that we wanted to promote this. We decided that this was something that Wyoming um, should treasure and should be proud of. And, and it is quite remarkable. I mean, this is a testimony to Wyoming's wide open spaces that we still have one of, we still have the world's longest mule deer migration, right? So we're doing something right in how we're managing these lands. Um, so we produced a report uh, with, with beautiful pictures and maps, and we identified the top 10 areas of concern. We identified the top 10 areas that, m that might challenge animals to continue migrating um, into the future. Then we worked with National Geographic photographer Joe Reese, and Joe went out and spent two seasons photographing these animals along their migration routes. We put together a photo exhibit. Um, that photo exhibit traveled around the, the state. Um, it went from, it started on Earth Day in Laramie, then it went to Rock Springs. It was right here on June 24th. Um, and then in mid-September, we finished with Lander and, and Pinedale. And so the goal here was to sort of tell the story of the Red Desert to Hoback migration and some of the threats that these animals face. We also, uh, Joe and my colleague Hall Sawyer, who discovered the route, put together a short film. Uh, it's a four minute long film. It was uh, hosted on National Geographic site. Over 1.5 million people have seen this film and learned about the Red Desert to Hoback migration. Uh, and you can too if you go to National Geographic or you go to migrationinitiative.org. Um, and then finally, um, there's, there's already been uh, some conservation actions and, and, and some potential conservation solutions. Since we started this work and since we released this report, greater than five NGOs are, are working on protecting the route, in, including several state and federal agencies, 
you know, are sort of working to tackle this top 10 list. And one of those that is the most exciting and most promising um, is at the Fremont Lake bottleneck. And so this is a place where at this point, four to 5,000 animals who have already traveled 100 miles squeezed through a quarter mile buffer between the town of Pinedale and Fremont Lake. And I know you can't see it in the back of the room, but there's a little chunk of private land right there, which really complicates um, this bottleneck. And so here's that, here's that chunk of private land. Here's Fremont Lake. You got public land all around the lake. The town, literally the outskirts of Pinedale are right here. This is a subdivision. Um, and all 4,000 deer come through this, this piece of property. Well, in the course of, of telling this story and getting people excited about this, we learned that that piece of property, 350 acres, was for sale. And um, since, we find that, we, since we found that out, um, one of our partners, the Conservation Fund, led by Luke Lynch, who's here at, here at Jackson, and I think here today, um, has contacted the landowners now under lease to purchase this property um, for $2.1 million. Uh, Luke's busy raising money to buy this. Uh, and if successful, this, you know, this will take the top, this was our top threat. So this will take one of the top 10 threats off of the, off of the list um, and greatly improve the, the connectivity and, and the means of these animals uh, to migrate through the town of Pinedale. So I, I want to end right here. And this is where I think we need to begin. Zoomed in to the impediments that these animals face as they migrate. You know, I've, I've shown you maps at, a, at, a, at the 30,000 foot view and I've talked about some sort of um, 30,000 foot ideas, but I think the work that needs to be done, and it's not us that will do it, it's, it's others, people that will do it. We're sort of providing the information, but the work that needs to be done needs to be done at this level. Um, so this is, this is probably a good place to end. Yeah, so the, so the question referred to uh, the graph that I showed with Cody elk and their fat dynamics from that, that graph was from late, showed percent body fat in late winter and then, and then late summer, so March to September, over, over several different years. And the question was, why doesn't it always kind of come back to the same spot? And, and that, basically what's being expressed there is, um, is a combination of how harsh the winter is and how productive the summer is. So in a productive summer, these animals will recover body fat and, 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 and on average they'll be, have higher body fat in a really harsh winter. So for winter, for these, for these ungulates, they're basically fasting all winter long and, and losing fat. So if the winter is long enough, they, they keep losing fat and, and that puts them, and, and, you know, and that drives that, that number down and so they're at really low fat. If it's, if, it's, if it's long enough, many of them will starve. So, so basically, it's, it's winter conditions and summer conditions that allow these animals to put on fat and then also determine how fast they lose it in winter. Um, you were mentioning that the animals are learning their migration behaviors from their mothers, um, but it seems that they've also learned to go to the feeding grounds. So currently, with there's proposals to phase out feeding areas. So are there any data to show that animals, if these feeding grounds would be phased out, um, the animals that have learned to come to these feeding areas are going to be able to learn to maybe alter their behavior? There has been some work done, and I'm not, um, I'm not familiar with the data. O occasionally, the game and fish um, either, you know, they, they Sometimes they don't feed at specific feed grounds or they, or they shorten the feeding season. Um, you know, and, and essentially, you know, if the food is not there, the elk go somewhere else and, 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 and look for food in the, on the native winter range that's sort of adjacent to the feed ground. And so I don't have, I don't have hard data on that question, but my, my suspicion is that, you know, there might be some confusion initially, but um, over time, 
these, and, and over, a sh I would think, a sh pretty short period of time, these animals will, f will figure out where the next best winter forage is and, and go there. And again, they're still migrating, and I want to be clear about that. You know, winter feeding has not caused these animals to abandon their migration routes. They're still migrating. Um, they just do it differently than the unfed animals. Do you see the coyote migration, perhaps the disruptions in their migration paths there, that perhaps that's also contributing a great deal to the decline in the health of the horse? Probably not. So, um, Unlike the red desert to hoback that I, that I showed, um, most of the elk that migrate into Yellowstone, uh, some of them winter on some private land, some, some big private ranches, but almost as soon as they start their migrations, they're on the forest. And so they're migrating up through the forest, through wilderness areas, and into the parks. So most of their migrations are protected. Um, so, my, for, so for elk in the greater Yellowstone, um, sort of the, the connectivity of their migration routes isn't really an issue. And um, with respect to the decline of elk more broadly across the GYE, you know, there's, I, I, I would point to three factors. Grizzly bears, which prey on neonates, wolves, which prey on young calves and adults, and then also drought, like the, the reduced calf recruitment and pregnancy rates that we've shown. But it's not just one thing, sort of all, and then in other areas, there's de there is development on winter range. So, um, lots of different changes for the elk in Northwest Wyoming. How has the uh, disruption in the migration corridor correlated with the overall population of those deer? We don't know the answer to that. Um, so, and, and this is this is where we sort of have to we have to apply some of what we're learning, and 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 you know what what we have learned is that these migrations are, are critical, and these migrations are, allow these animals to access high quality habitat right when they're coming off winter range, when they're coming off the period of starvation. And so at this point, we're making the inference that if they have to speed up, if they have to detour around their areas, we, we've documented that they're stopping over less, that, that all those behaviors come at some cost to the, to the foraging benefit that they typically receive by migrating. We don't know how much that cost is, and we don't know if it influences uh, you know, their ability to, to raise their young that summer or survive the winter the next winter. Um, you know, all of those things are linked. We just don't know the magnitude of the effect. I'm always encouraged to see the um, underpasses and overpasses when I drive through here at Pinedale. Are they being successfully used, or as successfully as people hope they would? Yeah, so the question was about um, the, whether the underpasses and overpasses that have been recently installed in 2012 in, in Pinedale are, are being successful. And absolutely, they're, being, they're, they're very successful. There was a, my understanding, I haven't worked on that directly, but um, my understanding is that, uh, is that when they, there was a little bit of an adjustment period where the animals, because they also fence the, the, the highway there, which sort of funnels them to the underpasses or to the overpasses. So the, the first migration, there was a little bit of delay in them kind of figuring it out, but they've definitely figured it out now, and, and thousands of, uh, so about 80% of the mule deer use the underpasses, and about 80% of the pronghorn use the overpasses, and thousands of animals have migrated both spring and fall over those crossing structures. Isn't the predation, predation self-regulating, and over time won't uh, it self-regulate? Um, and I think what you're referring to there is, is sort of the predator-prey cycles, and um, yes, ab absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and, and in theory. Does that sound pinheaded enough? <laughs> um, <clears throat> those, you know, predator and prey regulate one another, and, uh, you know, the question is, so if, if wolves and grizzly bears, um, you know, ate themselves out of house and home by, by eating up all of the, uh, you know, elk calves, you know, is that, is that a place where we want to go? Um, you know, ev eventually, wolves and bears would be doing less well because there would be less food. Um, but um, that's, that's kind of a rough way to manage wildlife. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's happened like with, you know, we see that in, in lynx and snowshoe hares, but um, a lot of wildlife management is sort of, is, is trying to blunt those sort of predator-prey cycles. Um, Plus, it, takes, it, it may take a really long time for us, for us to see that, and we have to sort of make management decisions now. So. 
Okay, thank you everyone.